Well, good morning, church. How is everyone doing today? Good? Are we awake? Are we ready for the day? Well, it's so good to be with you all this morning on Mother's Day. Um, as Pastor Gil and Debbie said, my name is Jenny, and my husband, Pastor Brandon, and I are the campus pastors here. And on behalf of both of us, our whole team, we'll say it one more time, happy Mother's Day. Well, this morning, I'm excited to come to you. I've had a word stirring in my heart for a few months now that I just, I, I didn't know when the opportunity would present, um, but in some meetings, I said, you know, I think I've got this word. I think Mother's Day might be appropriate to share it. And in alignment with Pastor Gill and Pastor Brandon and our team, they said, yeah, let's, let's do that. So what I wanna do this morning though is actually build off of some current series that we've been doing. Pastor Brandon did a series, uh, just a little quick mini series these past couple of weeks called It's Who I Am. And then right before that, we finished a series called Building a Strong Christian Life. And within the context of that series, we had a message that Pastor Gil preached on uh, April 3rd. You're gonna wanna write that down because you're gonna wanna go back to that message after you hear today. But it was a message on authority. And so as he spoke that message on authority, he says this, we, we got these sermon discussion guides that are available online. We may have a few copies available here. But in that sermon discussion guide, Pastor Gill taught us and showed us that God is the one who established authority and he did so for this reason, to ensure that things are done decently and in order so that each generation might have the opportunity to live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. So we have this thought of authority that's been kind of stirring in us. I saw a lot of discussion and chatter on Facebook of, oh, we need a whole series on authority. And absolutely we do, I hope we get that one day. But for now we've got this message and we even had additional resources in that sermon discussion guide on authority. And so I took that message and I'm thinking, okay Lord, authority lining up under that. And then Pastor Brandon, of course, the past couple of weeks, laid a phenomenal foundation for who we are in Christ. Because I don't know about you, but I don't have to look very far to see that our world is in an identity crisis. Everywhere we look, we are, it's, you know, we're who we are based on what we do. We're who we are based on what gender we are. We're, we're who we are based on our sexual preference. There's all these different things and people we're looking to. We're looking to our insta, the influencers on YouTube. We've got, even now you see commercials and I'm getting ads for, do your children, do your, does your four-year-old wanna be a YouTube influencer? And I'm like, she probably does. I found the videos, but I'm not gonna tell her that. <laughs> I'm not speaking that over her. But this identity, it's so, the enemy has come in and he wants to rob us of who God has called us to be. And so on Mother's Day, I thought, well, of course, I have to reference the great theologian, P.D. Eastman. And, and the question that every child asks, are you my mother? It's a great little book. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but we're gonna go, we're gonna look at it, and I promise we're gonna pull up the Bible too. I have to tease, uh, Pastor Spencer does our notes, and I sent this to him. I said, I wanna go over this book. And he said, okay, do you have any other notes? <laughs> no, nah, we'll just do this. No, <laughs> yes, Pastor Spencer, I have more notes. We're gonna preach from the Bible today. But I, I was th as I was preparing my message, I, I couldn't help but think of this book. Um, so in case you don't know, so we're, gonna, we're just gonna briefly go through it. I'm not gonna read it word for word. But basically, it, it starts with a mother bird. She's sitting on her egg. And of course, the egg is ready to hatch. And so she says, oh, I've got to feed my baby bird. So she leaves. But then, as she's gone, something happens. The baby bird is born. The egg hatches. And so naturally, the bird pops up and says, well, where's my mother? The very first thing he knows to do, his most natural instinct, where is my mother? He didn't see her anywhere. So he decides, well, I'm gonna go look for her. So out of the nest he goes. Notice that he goes down, down, down. He falls, he literally steps out and falls out of the nest, okay? And he actually ends up walking around and he passes, the book says he passes right by his mother. He didn't even know who she was or what she looked like and he ends up just walking right past. Well, then he comes across and he gets to a kitten and he says, are you my mother? And this kitten looks at him like, you're a crazy bird. She doesn't even say anything, she just looks at him. 
And he kind of gets the hint. Okay, I guess this isn't it. And so then he comes to a hen and says, are you my mother? And the hen says, no. (laughs) Duh. And so then he keeps going. And we get to the dog. He says, are you my mother? And the dog says, I am not your mother. I'm a dog. How could I be your mother? And then he goes on and he finds a cow. Are you my mother? Well, how could I be your mother? I am a cow. So we've graduated from them saying nothing at all to emphasizing we're, these things are different. We are not alike, okay? No, I'm not your mother. So the baby bird stops and he thinks and he thinks and he, he's like, okay, I'm just gonna keep going on. So then he comes across, so he goes from animals, which he knows he is, to suddenly, well, maybe I'm something else. Maybe I'm a thing. So he finds a car. He finds a boat. The book says he finds a plane. And in each of these things, he says, are you my mother? No, obviously we know the answer. I'm not your mother. But then he lands on and he finds this big thing. And he is so excited when he finds this big thing because he knows he has been on this long mission, this long journey, and you are my mother. And if you've read the book, this is the fun part as a mom where you get to go, snort because it makes this loud noise, and he goes, oh my goodness, this is not my mom. And I just, where am I? I just wanna go home. But then you watch as this snort lifts up that baby bird, and he's uh, he's freaking out. I don't know what to do, I just wanna go home. And the snort puts that baby bird back up in his nest. And now he's resting peacefully in that nest. And of course, here comes mom. And mom says, do you know who I am? And Baby Bird says, yes, I know who you are. You are a bird, and you are my mother. And so I read that story today because there's so many great things that we can pull from it. First of all, to be reminded that though the mother went to go get food for her young baby, she was never gone. She was always there, and that's God. God is always, doesn't matter where we are or what we do, he's never left us. The Bible tells us he's never forsaken us. He's always with us. And then, of course, the baby bird falls out of the nest, and I'm like, duh, the fall, right? From the beginning, we fell, and things changed. But it did. We, the fall happened, and so we went from Adam and his wife in the garden to sin entering the world, and they were disconnected, they had fallen. And suddenly this hunt for our identity begins. It's where the hunt began to ensue, specifically for women, but also for men. It wasn't limited to women. So looking at this book, and I think about the world we live in today, and you realize we're all on a hunt. Like I said, we're looking for validation in what we do, in who we are, what we think. And can you imagine if in this book, and I wouldn't be surprised if at some point it's rewritten in our culture, what if in this book the bird came to the kitten and said, are you my mother? And she goes, "Mm mm-hmm. And then he goes to the hen and says, are you my mother? Well, of course I am. I'm a hen, but I'm your mother. And just, you go along, along, that would be ridiculous. We're like, that's not his mother. But the world we live in We can be whoever we want to be. We can do whatever we want to do. That's what we hear. We've had this this small deception that has grown into now what we see, and people, it's like, what what is going on? The Bible says that we have eyes to see. Let him, he who has eyes to see, see. Jesus helps us to see us for who we are and the world for what he created it to be, but there's a lie that has crept in and people have fallen prey to this lie and this deception at the core of who we are. And make no mistake, Satan came in to do that on purpose. It's not a mistake. But that's why it was so timely to hear this word by Pastor Brandon, reminding us of our true identity, that we are chosen and loved by God, that we are holy and blameless in his sight, and that we're children of God. That was his message number one, just kind of in summary. And in the second message, he urged us that we have to stand strong because we have an enemy who's come to kill, steal, and destroy. And just as he did to Jesus, just done to Jesus, you know he's doing it to us. 
He's challenging that identity that God has given us and he's urging us to stand strong. We have to stand strong. So, some of you that have been here know that I wanted to teach a message this morning on understanding women. So you're probably wondering, Pastor Jenny, when are you getting to the good stuff? Okay, because I wanna know why my wife can never decide what she wants for dinner. And I just really hope you're gonna answer that question. Well, I'm really sorry to tell you, I can't answer that question for you. We're gonna change our mind. All I could figure out was that for me, I just wanna be fed. So if you'll put some food in front of me, generally I'm a happy gal. But understanding women. And I want you to look at today's title. So when we talk about understanding women, I wanna talk to you today about how women we've seen historically in the Bible and who God created us to be, that he has designed us to come under the authority, the God-given authority that he has placed in our lives to help others stand, to allow us to stand and to help others to stand. And so I needed to give you the context of those two messages to kind of draw to where we're going this morning. But women and men, if you look in Galatians 3, 26 through 29, I wanna read that to you. It says this, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as you were baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are a Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now it's important we start here with this scripture and understanding women because I need you to understand that women and men are both equally valued in God's eyes. Okay, so the value that is placed on us, the scripture shows us, it doesn't matter who you are, what you do. It doesn't matter our race, our rank, or our sex. We are all equal in Christ, okay? So that equality is the value that God places on us, okay? Where the equality, I'm gonna separate it out a little bit this morning, it's not that we're not equal, but the Bible shows us that men and women do have very specific roles. God created us for a specific intent and purpose. If not, why did he create us at separate times? Why does he continually show us different roles? Now, as we go on this journey this morning to understand women and look at understanding women in the Bible, I want you to know that God has never been confused about women and their role and who they are. This isn't about how God's view has changed. What it is, is ever since the fall, we, as I said, as women, have been on a mission. We've been on a hunt like this little baby bird. Trying, we're the ones trying to figure out who we are. We can't seem to figure it out. And so, but it's natural because there was this, when we fell, there was this separation. And I wanna, I wanna look at that. So just like at the, with a book, you gotta start at the beginning. In order to understand women, you gotta start at the beginning. So we're gonna look at the beginning in Genesis. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter two, and we're gonna start in verse 18. While you find that spot in your Bible, uh, let me pray for us as we prepare to hear God's word this morning. Well, Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for your love for each individual in this room, for every mother. Lord, Holy Spirit, we just ask you to help us right now. You are our helper. Would you open up our hearts, help us to hear your word, what you're speaking to us as a body of believers, as the Big C Church, and what you're speaking to us individually. Thank you, word, that your word would go forth this morning, that it will not return void. We fix our eyes on you and look to you to know who we are as men and women in the church. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen. All right, so we're gonna read Genesis 2, starting in verse 18. It says, and the Lord God said, so of course, in case you're not familiar, God's been creating the heavens and the earth, okay? So we're we're in creation, and he picks up, he's already made Adam, and he's also already made all of the animals. And so this is where we pick up. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. 
So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So I kind of think of this baby bird who's looking at these different things and like, you're not my mother. And Adam had to feel the same way, right? Like he's naming all these things, he's having a good time. But he's noticing a trend here, like these things aren't coming alone. They're, a lot of them are in pairs. And he's, he's naming them. And all the while, he's looking for his own helper. Who's going to be my mate? Who's going to be my helper? And so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and shall become one flesh. I want you to notice something here. The Bible does not say, this was mind blowing to me, maybe, I'm sure many of you already knew this. The Bible does not say, this is now bone of my bone. He made him into woman and Adam called her Eve. Adam did not call her Eve before the fall. She was named woman. So some translations actually say, they don't actually even reference a rib coming out of Adam. They say that God created woman from his side. God designed women from the beginning to be a helper, to come from the side, to, co to partner along, to come alongside man. One anonymous person writes, she was not made out of his head to surpass him, nor from his feet to be trampled on, but from his side to be equal to him and near his heart to be dear to him. You see, before the fall, man and woman were one. They were actually referred to as Adam. It was man and it was woman. There was no Eve. And if you're unsure of this, Genesis 3.20 is where we first see Adam call her Eve because she's the mother of all things. It wasn't until the separate identity for her wasn't even created until she experienced a separation from her husband and from the authority that God had set up. So let's look at Genesis 3.16. So Adam and Eve, we know, they do the wrong thing. Sin enters the world, and God comes to them. He talks to Adam, and he talks, well, he talks to, the woman, to the man and to the woman. And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your, and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So right away we see some impacts from sin and from the fall, falling out of that nest. How did that impact us as women? Well, number one, women have now, because we were designed to be co-partners with our spouses, co-partners with men, but we've fallen. Things have gotten, as Pastor Spencer said, with, you know, we can distort God's goodness. Well, now we've distorted our view of ourselves. And so we think we are designed to rule over men. With that separation of authority came a sinful desire to rule over men. God never intended us, and it wasn't about being in charge. But again, now we're just confused. We're missing the original design to co labor, to be partners. And I know this is specifically talking to men and women, married couples, but I think it applies to our, our world, right? Like we're designed to come together. God created us to be, to complement man. So first, the first thing that we get confused on is we think we're to rule over men, that we're the ones to be in charge. Number two, we look to men for value and affirmation instead of God. Your desire shall be for your husband. So it's a twofold thing. It's one, you're gonna want to root be over him, but also there's this other part of us that instead of looking to God for who we are, knowing that we're blameless and we're loved and we're chosen by him, we're looking to a man for affirmation, whether that's our husband, whether that's our dad, whether that's just men around us. We're finding who we are in our validation. We find women, it's a natural inclination since the fall to do that. And to address the last part, that it says, he shall rule over you. Okay, great, so Pastor Judy, you're saying men are supposed to be in charge, and that's what the Bible says. Well, let's look at what that really means. 
The Spirit-Filled Life Bible says this, he shall rule over you, asserts the divine assignment of the husband's servant leader role. There is no evidence that this was ever intended as a diminishing of the woman's person or giftedness, but rather as a redemptive role assigned to the husband toward the wife as a mean towards reinstating the original partnership. So God's just saying, listen, this is gonna happen so that we can pull this back together. That song we just sang, I lay my whole life down. I lift my hands up, I lay my whole life down. That's what God's asking men to do. He's asking them to lay down their lives just as Christ laid his life down for the church. Men are to lay their life down for their wives. So when we look at women, the first thing I want you to grab out of Genesis is that God created women to come alongside and lift others up. So while originally this, this assignment of being a helper coming alongside was given to Eve to come alongside Adam as a helper and a companion, it extends much further than that, right? Because we see women, we look around, and you notice, you see right away, there is a difference, there's a distinct difference we see with our natural eyes between men and women. And it's a beautiful thing that God has created to draw forth and bring forth. Let me give you an example. Um, so when we look in the text, again, helper. So you think helper, nurturer, I think I've got four children, seven, five, three, and seven months. And I do a lot of helping around my house. There's a lot of helping, and Pastor Brandon uh, is awesome. He's in a phenomenal dad. He took care of all the helping this morning. But women just naturally, in most cases, not that men don't nurture, but women are just more nurturing. We just like to come alongside. But again, you look, and God needed a helper for Adam. He needed someone to come alongside, to nurture, to partner with him. And you look at Adam, and what was Adam's first assignment? It was to name and identify the animals. And I think that same is true for men today. Men, you need to be ready to name and identify and call out who your wives are, who the women are, who your children are. You should be speaking and declaring. And so there's this, but kind of in our real world too, this happens with like everyday practical things. So um, when I was younger, this isn't even my story, it's my dad and my sister's story, but I'm gonna tell it. So my sister was probably about eight years old and it had been raining outside and she wanted to ride her bicycle down the street to the neighbor's house. And my dad said, no, you're not to ride your bicycle, it's raining, it was slippery. Well, in this case, she did not submit to his authority as the father of the household and she decided to ride her bicycle down the street. Well, it's about 30 minutes later, she comes in and her arm's all mangled and she's missing a tooth and he's like, Dad, I rode my bike. He's laying in his chair. He looks up from his, and he says, you're gonna sit on that couch, you broke your arm, you broke your tooth, I'm gonna finish my nap, and we'll, then we'll go to the hospital. And he lay back down, okay? So there's the dad, he identified the problem, he identified what happened, what she did wrong, but you can only imagine what happened when my mother came into the house, and oh, my baby, what's wrong? Truth, and oh my goodness, I, let me help you, right? And so dads, they, they wanna call out these things. Men, we wanna call out these things. But women have such a great place to come alongside, to help and to nurture, and we should be speaking that out. So what does this look like in the context of wives and husbands and in Christian households? Uh, you can write down Ephesians 5, 21 through 24, and Colossians 3, 18 through 21. I'm gonna read them to you. But these are great pictures of what this nurturing, what this help, and when we're coming under the authority that God's placed in us, how God's designed that order to come. Remember, Pastor Gil said, when we're stepped into that authority, when we're, it's, it's God, that God-given authority, it set us up to make things look like this. And so, Ephesians 5, 21. And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord, and for a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church, and as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. So it's just giving you that picture. Colossians three eighteen, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. 
Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. So again, as we learned in that teaching on April 3rd, A Passion for Authority, this is done to ensure that things are done decently and in order so that each generation might have the opportunity to live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Now, I want to clarify for us this morning because some of you in here might say, well, I've been in an abusive relationship. Maybe you've had an abusive partner or a parent. And so that booklet, the sermon discussion guide, it addresses that while authority is designed by God, there are people in authority that are not good, right? And so authority is good, but there can be people in authority that are not good. And the Bible never teaches us to, authority is not this blind submission to just do whatever, I'm supposed to do whatever the authority says. Well, if the authority is going against the word of God, well, that's a problem, and that has to be dealt with. And that particular sermon discussion guide talks about the different challenges we may have with people who are not good, and how, what does that look like? What does being submitted to that authority look like? And sometimes that's just honoring that authority, but God's never asking you to do it in a blind manner so that you lose sight of who you are in Christ. And so, number two, I want you to understand as we continue this talk, and we're gonna look at some specific women now, within God's alignment is where we find individuality and assignment. So for all of us, fulfillment comes from when we are fulfilling the God-given purpose and plan for our lives. We see this in John 4.34 when Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. While Jesus was fully God and fully man, he was also submitted to God the Father. He only did in line with authority, he only did what God instructed him to do. And so when we're in alignment, we find that individually. When we're in alignment with who God has called us to be, we can do what he's called us to do. And so I have a few women this morning, we're not gonna read through all the text because that would take many, many days. Um, but we're gonna reference it. We're gonna look at women who came under the authority that God had placed, the God-given authority that God had placed in their lives to help others to stand, okay? So the first woman we have to look at is of course Esther. If you're not familiar with Esther, she was an orphan. She was adopted by her uncle. She was a Jew. And so um, she ended up being invited into the king's court in Persia. Um, and she became the king's wife. But during this process, there was a really bad man named Haman. And he wanted to kill all of the Jews. So that means Esther and her entire nation. And so... The king did not want to kill the Jews, let me clarify. The king wanted people to just to worship him. But he had this guy Haman come under him, and Haman really liked getting affirmation. Haman really liked people really worshiping him. And so he saw, ugh, these Jews, they're worshiping this thing called God, you need to get rid of them. So he goes to the king, and the king's like, okay, cool. Issues a decree. Well, Esther, so let's back up. Let's see what Esther did. So remember, Esther's an orphan who was adopted by her uncle. Her uncle was named Mordecai. And so her uncle helped to set up the process of her becoming a king's wife. But he told her this very important, Esther, and Esther's not her original name, by the way. He said, you cannot tell them you're a Jew. Because if you do that, then you won't be able to go through this process. But I know Mordecai had a word from the Lord that Esther was to walk out. This was her, part of her assignment that God had put on her life. And so he says, Esther, don't tell him you're a Jew. And so she respects that authority. She aligns herself with him, and she does not identify herself as a Jew until the right time. So Esther gets into the king's courts. The king's pleased with her, likes her. And so she goes to... Um, and she goes under the submission of Hege, who was actually the eunuch in charge of all the wives because the king never had one wife in all these, on, and during these times. There were multiple wives. Esther wasn't the only one. And so if the king, he actually had to call his wife into, the, into his chambers, into his courtroom. And so wives could not just come and go as they pleased. They couldn't just walk in whenever they wanted. 
well, this decree is issued by, Haman has the king issue the decree to kill all the Jews, and Mordecai's like, Esther, you're gonna have to speak up. You need to do something about this. And she's like, well, Uncle Mordecai, what do you want me to do? If I walk into his court uninvited, I could die. The only way I can walk in, and if he does his gold scepter and gives me the thing of approval, that's the only way I'll live. So you want me to die? You want to risk my life? And he's kind of like, yeah, because the rest of us are going to die if you don't. And I know that God's, so she says, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do. So under the authority of Mordecai, she then submits herself fully under the authority of God. The Bible says that she fasted and prayed for three days, seeking God for what to do next and got the Jew Jewish people to do that. He, she said, I need you to do this with me. And so we see that Esther aligned herself under Mordecai, under Hege, under God. And then what do you think happens? If you've read the story of Esther, it's a great story. Of course, a way is made because once the king makes a decree, he actually couldn't undo that now. So the king says, well, what I can do is I can say you're allowed to defend yourself. You're allowed to fight off these people. And so she's like, okay, yeah, do that. So she actually went into the king's court not once but twice and got, she was waved by, she, she found favor from the king and in the Lord. And so as she submitted herself under the, these authorities, we see that she, she stood herself, God allowed her to stand in the presence of the king, but then she allowed an entire Jewish nation was able to stand because she was submitted under the authority. I can't even imagine what would have happened. I mean, she would have never even been in her position if she would have told him from the beginning, I'm a Jew. He wouldn't have even considered her. And so she had to listen to Mordecai. She was very submitted to Hege and under his leadership, she didn't know what to do. She'd never been a king's wife before. What am I supposed to do? How does this work? And she had submitted to God and fasted. And so we see where this woman came under, helped others to stand. There's also the widow at Zarephath. She's uh, mentioned in 1 Kings 17, eight through 24. We're not gonna read the scripture today, but I do wanna pull it up and reference it because there's a few things in here that are pretty neat. So. During this time, there was a great famine going on, and God's talking to the prophet Elisha, and he tells the prophet Elisha, I want you to go to Zarephath. And he's like, well, why do you want me to go there, God? Well, he said, for there I have instructed a widow to feed you. The Bible says in 1 Kings 17, verse 9, it says, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So Elijah goes as he's instructed, he listens, and he comes across this widow who's literally collecting sticks so that she can make a fire. And Elijah says, can you bring me a cup of water? And so she goes to get the cup of water, and he says, well, can you bring me a morsel of bread? Can you bring me something to eat? And she's like, well, just so you know, I don't have any bread. I've got a little oil and a little flour, and I was actually going to go make this so that me and my son can die because there's nothing left. We're in famine. And Elijah says, okay. Well, he says, I don't want you to be afraid. He said, I want you to do what you're doing, and I want, I want you to get your oil, I'm gonna get your flour, but at first, I want you to make me something to eat. She's like, did you not just hear me? I'm about to make my last meal. I'm going to die, and you want me to give you some too? I mean, I can only imagine what she thought. Well, I guess I'm gonna die anyway, so I might as well make something for this crazy guy. But Elijah makes a promise to her on behalf of the Lord. He says, the God's, the, thus says the Lord God, in verse 14, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. And so she did as she was instructed, as Elijah asked her to do, and it never ran dry. Her and her son and Elijah were sustained for the duration of that famine. So we see where she aligned herself under, she listened to Elisha because again, Elisha was a prophet. So in that time, God wasn't just speaking freely to everyone as we have now through the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus did on the cross. He, he, he had specific men of God he was speaking through. So her responding to Elijah would be just as if she was responding to God himself. 
But we also see where the text tells us that God had commanded her. So the Bible doesn't tell us how he commanded her. It doesn't say that he wrote it on the wall or he came down in this heavenly voice or he got a kitten to come tell her. The Bible just says he commanded her. So I like to think it's that inside voice that we hear when God speaks to us on the inside. Something in her knew when she saw Elijah, I'm supposed to feed that man. And so I believe that she submitted to Elijah. I believe that she submitted to God in that instruction when she was told, make something for Elijah first. So she, she came under that authority. She did as she was instructed and she was able to literally live. She was able to stand, her son was able to stand and Elisha was able to stand. But I love this story because it doesn't end there. Not only do we see that example of where she was sustained through a famine, but after the famine, her son gets sick and he actually dies. And she's like, Elisha, is God, is just this cruel God that he would get me through this famine? He did this just to watch my son die? And Elijah says, no, no, we won't have that. And so Elijah goes and he prays over the boy and he comes back to life. So yet again, and she's like, okay, now I know you serve God. And I'm like, you didn't realize it when your little bit of oil and flour never ran out, but okay. Sometimes things happen to happen on a more personal level for us to know that God is real. But again, we see two instances back to back where it's clear when she submitted herself under the authority, others were able to stand. Let's look in Luke chapter eight, verses one through three, the women who followed Jesus. I wanna read this. It says, now it came to pass afterward that, the, they, that he, talking about Jesus, went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the 12 were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, so we're naming these certain women, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, provided for him from their substance. So in this text, we see women of all different backgrounds, single women, married women, women with a past. Notice Mary was delivered from seven demons. They gave of their resource to support Jesus and his disciples. They aligned themselves under the authority of Jesus and literally helped sustain him and the disciples, their ministry, so that they could go. So as, again, the whole thought we're on right now is it, within God's alignment, we find individuality and assignment, right? So, so far we've talked about Esther. We see the very specific assignment that God had on her life. We've talked about the widow and what God did through her and in her. And we've looked at the women who followed Jesus. So now you're like, well, Pastor Jenny, so are you saying women just have to come help feed and I don't know, just help people, is that all they do? As if that's not a big enough responsibility, as if that's not important. I think that's pretty incredible. But we have one last woman I wanna look at who had an assignment from the Lord, and I love this picture because it's such a redemptive picture in the scripture of where we, have, as women, have been brought since Jesus gave his life for us. And that's the woman of Priscilla. So Priscilla is actually, she was a female teacher, preacher, in a time where females had, like, it was actually better. She was a Jew as well. And in Jewish culture, they had been taught almost, it would be better to be born a dog than a female, okay? There was no respect for women in this time, very little um, especially to be out preaching and teaching and ministering God's word. But we have an example of Priscilla who co-labored and co-ministered alongside her husband, Aquila, and alongside Paul. So this would have been after the, the time of Jesus, that Jesus had given his life. And so that's where we come. I'm gonna go back to, it is Galatians, right? Suddenly, uh, Galatians 3.26. Remember what we started with, the text we started with, for you are all sons of God, sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're gonna leave it right there. 
Go back to verse 28. Thank you, Mr. Jack. You are all one in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Priscilla came alongside and just like Eve, woman, was designed to be man's helper to come alongside. We see this beautiful picture. You can read through the New Testament um, where this, there's actually a reference. When Paul first meets, it's, they're referred to as Aquila and Priscilla. The man's name always preceded the woman's name. But something, something life-changing happened as Paul was meeting with them on his journey. He was tired, he was broken, and he comes across a couple who is co-ministering, and they're encouraging him in some things, and he has this revelation that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Again, we're seeing our identity as who women are, who women, who God made women to be. They're just as valuable as men. They're just as valuable to God. But we don't read this text and think, okay, well, that, the Bible says that, so there's no, there's no races, there's no separation of the classes, there's no men or women. No, that would be silly. We look around the room, we can see there are men and women in the room. We know there are Jews and there are Greeks. There are people of different, so the text isn't telling us these things don't exist. It's just saying that these things don't define our value in Christ and as women, so Priscilla, you look at Priscilla, she of course was submitted under the authority of God. She was submitted under her husband. So in line with her husband, she was able to still teach and preach during a time where that should have never been allowed to be done. But God, God used her in a mighty way to fulfill what he designed her to do. So what are all these women, what is understanding these women, these examples, what does that have to do with us today? Why does any of this matter to us? Well, the final thing I want you all to walk away with today is that we all must step into alignment and assignment. God's inviting all of us to do that. So I bring you back to our great theologian, Are You My Mother? In a world that's screaming at both men and women who we should be, what we should be, we need to step into alignment to fulfill our assignment. We need to know who are we. We're children of God, those of us that have professed Jesus as our Savior. Who are we under? Well, we're under authority, God-given authority. So that's God, maybe it's a husband, boss, teacher, coach, pastor. The list goes on. I will encourage you, listen to that message from April 3rd. But what has God asked us to do? We have to step in. Those are the things God's inviting us to step into. So I want you to know you must step into alignment and assignment. God's inviting you to do that. But I want you to walk away. If you'd walk away with nothing else today, I want you to walk away with this. And that's to be a snort. What did that snort do? That snort put that baby bird back where he was supposed to go. And I want you, women, you should be looking at other women and calling out to them who they are in Christ speaking that identity over them that God and Jesus designed them to be. Don't look to the world. Listen, just because we live in 2022 doesn't mean we are any smarter than they were when Jesus walked this earth, right? We have the scriptures, we have God's word to tell us and remind us who we are in Christ as men and women, who women are and who are they're designed to be. So be a snort. Call out those things. Men, look at the women in your life. Look at your mothers and your daughters and your sisters, your coworkers, your neighbors, and call out the God-given identity that God has given them. In closing, I'm gonna invite Pastor Gil to come up to be a snort. He's gonna, he's gonna declare, as we said, a word over just our mothers, a prayer, a declaration over them. And then as we close, I don't know if Spencer is planning to do this, but this is the song I want him to do. <laughs> We're gonna close with, with that last song we ended on. And as we sing, I lift my hands up, I lay my whole life down. My whole life now is for you. I want you to sing those words in the context of understanding that authority. Like Pastor Spencer said, we're lifting up our hands and recognizing the authority of God in our life. And ultimately, what has God invited all of us to do? Jesus said, it's greater to lay down your life 
than to be first in line. We have to surrender. We need to lay down. God said when we lay down our life, that's when you'll gain it. Don't, don't try to get the whole world and lose your soul. So I'm gonna invite Pastor Gil and Debbie up to say that prayer, and then I wanna invite you to worship with us. Well, first, let me highlight the fact that Jenny stood on this stage many, many times, but this is the first time she's brought the Word of God on a Sunday morning. I would like for you to join me in appreciating what a strong word that she's brought. Thank you so much. And, and I was thinking about uh, this newly found theological perspective that I have now in the book, Are You My Mother?, how the mama bird came back and the question was, do you know who I am? And when the baby bird said yes, <clears throat> I thought, boy, that, that's the key. Rather than us trying to figure out and all the world philosophies and the world views and all of the, you know, the different experiences we've had, good, bad, and everything in between, is coming back and first recognizing and acknowledging who God is. And as we do that, then the Lord will help us to understand who we are the way we were created and who we are individually. So if, if you're here this morning and you're a mom, doesn't matter at what age or stage you're at, uh, we'd like for you to stand. And as Jenny said, I'm going to snort over you. If you'd stand up, I know this, not, not all of you really want to do that, but just let, let us just embarrass you in a wonderful way for a few moments. And here's what I want to do. I, I want to just take God's point of view. And they're going to have some scriptures that will come up on the screen. And I'm going to prayerfully declare these over you. And uh, those of you that are sitting around, uh, these that are standing, you can either put your hand on them if that's appropriate, if you're the husband or one of the family, or you can certainly stretch your hand out towards them and join me in these scriptural declarations. And then once I'm done, uh, then Debbie's going to wrap us up in prayer and speak blessings over you. So moms, I want to remind you this morning as the scriptures come up from Proverbs chapter 31. Lord, we thank you that these women are clothed in strength and honor this morning. doesn't matter how they feel. It doesn't matter what the world has told them. doesn't matter what their own emotions and experiences are screaming. Lord, we speak strength and honor over them that clothes them. And Lord, allows them the opportunity to rejoice as the future unfolds in the time to come. Things right now might be challenging, but Lord, there's times of rejoicing that are coming. Lord, I thank you that you'll fill their heart and their spirit up with wisdom this morning so that as they open their mouth, that wisdom will begin to flow out. And Lord, that you'll do it in a nurturing way, that on her tongue, the law of kindness will be there. Sometimes that they have to say tough things, but Lord, you'll teach them how to do it in a way that builds people up and then undergirds people. Lord, I thank you that as she watches over the ways of her household, that you'll keep her away from idleness. You'll keep her away from things that put them in the swirl, that put them in the confusion, that get them stuck in the middle. But Lord, you'll help them to be moving forward as they keep their household, starting with their spouses and their children and whomever else that they're responsible for. Keep them moving forward. We thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you that if it's not happening today, that we hold to the promise that these women will reap where they have sown and at some point, their children will rise up and will call them blessed. Their children will come back and say, okay, mom, I get it now. I understand the challenges and the pressures and the responsibilities and the exhaustion you were dealing with. And I appreciate it and I love you for it. And Lord, for those that are in this position, Lord, I thank you that their husband will learn to speak up. Lord, that you would cause this, those men to declare not just what they see, not just what they would like to see, but Lord, to declare who they are and declare how much that they love and appreciate them for the role that they play and how God moves in and through their lives. We declare this over them and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we love you today. Thank you so much for your presence, that you've been here with us. God, thank you for the word that you spoke to us through Pastor Jenny this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray that you remind us today and every day moving forward of the things that you spoke down into our hearts this morning. Father, I thank you that you will begin to show us who we are in you. Show yes. us the plan and the purpose that you have for each of us for our lives. And then Lord, then help us to realign ourselves so that we can be fulfilled 
and fulfill the calling that you put on our lives. Lord, we love you. We bless you this morning. Lord, I bless these women. Lord, I pray that all of the mothers have a wonderful day today. Lord, would you wrap your arms around them and love them in a very personal and tangible way. Let them know how precious they are to their families. Let them know, Lord, that they're a gift and you love them and you're so proud of them. Refresh them today. Help them to have a great day today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, we learned in our Worship 101 that clapping of the hands in the Bible is not just a, an, a, an expressed appreciation, but it's also a declaration, like you clap your hands, like that is what we're going to do. And so can we applaud these moms, both as an appreciation and a declaration? They're a gift from the Lord. We thank you and we bless you. And moms, listen, we want to extend this as you leave today. Uh, there's a refreshment, a little treat for you. Please pick that up and do it as a very small but a heartfelt token from us. Also, the prayer and altar team will come back up. Anybody here who would like uh, to receive more prayer from the Lord, we don't want you to leave without the Lord giving you what He promised He would give you. Otherwise, would you stand to your feet and let's worship one more time and then Pastor Spencer is going to dismiss us this morning. God bless you this morning.